From KSA 12, the night beat starts right now. 478 new COVID-19 cases tonight. That brings the total confirmed cases in Bear County to 27,500. And 25 city leaders also reporting another record high number of deaths tonight. 11 more people have died, bringing the total death toll to 240. Overall, hospitalizations are slowly going down. 1,166 people are hospitalized, but two big numbers have increased. 436 people are in the ICU and 298 people are now on ventilators. A ventilator capacity at 45% and staffed hospital bed capacity at 11%. And more than 10,000 people have recovered so far. The San Antonio Metropolitan Health uh, Medical Director, Dr. Jun Wu, issued a health directive requiring that schools not reopen for on campus face to face instruction until after September 7, 2020. Metro health officials say they made that decision with the input of local stakeholders and education leaders. Yeah, so what exactly does this directive mean? All right, take a look. Remote learning for all students, public and private. Teachers able to use their classroom for video streaming as long as they're alone and school occupancy doesn't exceed 10%. There will also be no in-person extracurricular activities, including athletics, until on-campus learning resumes. This, of course, will affect high school football. Greg Simmons will have more details on that coming up in sports. School districts are required to come up with a written plan with safety and health protocols no later than August 21st. Metro Health Director Dr. Colleen Bridger says the September 7th date is not one that's set in stone. It just gives us a little bit more time to figure out what else we can do and really watch those uh, health numbers to see those indicators, whether they're improving or, or not, um, and gives us some more time to, to figure out here at the local level what makes the most sense. And as districts try to figure out their plans for the new school year, one superintendent is juggling his new role amid this pandemic. Dr. Mark Puig has been hired as the new South San ISD superintendent. It was just a month ago that he started the job. In his first TV interview, he tells the night team's Patty Santos his goal is to support teachers in the difficult task ahead. Every decision I make is through the prism of a teacher. I'm a teacher first. I just happen to be on special assignment right now. My special assignment is superintendent. That's great. Dr. Mark Puig stepped into his role as the new South San ISD superintendent on June 8th. The pandemic has forced him to hit the ground running from day one. When adversity strikes, leadership has to see the opportunity. And when adversity strikes, leadership has to be prepared to say, OK, what's the opportunity? What do we need to start doing differently to still thrive in the face of the challenges that are here. His goal is to be real but optimistic, to be deliberate but calm as he assures parents kids will be safe. We're going to make sure that every student and every teacher has the, the tools and the resources necessary to execute a virtual environment and thrive in that environment. Puig served as superintendent at Beeville ISD since 2016. It's about an hour and a half south of San Antonio. He takes over following a shakeup with the district leadership after three trustees resigned when Dr. Alejandro Flores resigned after less than a year on the job in August 2019. Flores took over for Dr. Abelardo Saavedra, who also resigned. Puig says he feels the board is united and he fits right in. I am confident that the school board is uh, well equipped and prepared and has the right mindset to make South Sand the best district on the planet. And I'm right there with them to make sure that happens. And when it comes to next year's budget, he feels the district has been prudent with its spending in the past and he doesn't think it will be financially compromised. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. The South San ISD school year is scheduled to start on August 12th. Classes will all be remote learning until further notice. And to see all of our back to school coverage, including fall plans for other school districts like NISD and SAISD, just head to KSAT.com and click on the back to school tab. A local hospital known for their trauma care helping San Antonio in the fight against COVID-19 with their ECMO program. The medical procedure is used as an alternative to putting someone on a ventilator. Brook Army Medical Center revealed it is treating civilian COVID-19 patients through this program. The night team's Tiffany Huertas has a look at the hospital's involvement 
during the pandemic. We, we have doubled our capacity for ECMO uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks to greater support the city uh, because it's, it's a specialized uh, uh, treatment. Air Force Colonel Patrick Osborne says Brook Army Medical Center is treating five civilian COVID-19 patients through their ECMO program. As those people get better and come off the machine, then we will take more. So how does BAMC identify civilian COVID-19 patients for this program? We have our own uh, separate ECMO contact line and so that the hospitals in the area know and, and they contact us directly through that. Local leaders have asked for more help from BAMC as hospitals get closer to capacity. That would help us a, a great deal if they would start taking uh, start taking patients. But Osborne says it's out of their control. Uh, those decisions are, are made way outside this building uh, uh, by federal entities and and basically we are on the receiving end of uh, we have to be ready for whatever mission we are given by our military chain of command or civilian chain of command um, and, and those decisions uh, we have really no control over. Bamsey says they are taking on additional trauma patients to ensure the region's trauma response remains unaffected by the pandemic. We've taken more and more as, as other hospitals in town have uh, uh, had more COVID to deal with than we have. Osborne says San Antonians must do their part to continue to stop the spread of COVID-19. The number of critically ill patients, the number of patients on ECMO, the number of patients on ventilators in ICUs, that continues to rise. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Well, about 100 people are out of a job tonight. BioBridge Global, which is the nonprofit parent company of South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, says the pandemic has greatly impacted its operations. The majority of the layoffs are in the Qualtex Laboratories Division. That's a team of about 700. Qualtex provides testing services for blood and plasma collection centers across the country. But due to COVID-19, donations have been low. CEO Martin Landon says in a statement, it was a difficult decision, but the layoffs will not impact its ability to provide services. More protections for residents in nursing homes or assisted living facilities. It's actually an extension of it. Bear County adding a change to its public health order. People who work at these long term care facilities cannot work at more than one location. This helps with the reducing the spread of COVID-19 during a time of high transmission. Just yesterday, 10 people living in long term care facilities died. No new deaths from congregate settings were reported today. Now to the latest in the Bear County Jail. There are around 3,600 inmates in jail, and Umber Sheriff Javier Salazar says he believes it's still too high. He says there are between 70 and 80 positive COVID-19 cases right now. Masks are still mandatory, and inmates get a new one every day. 48 BCSO deputies are positive. Five are hospitalized. Metro Health has a message for residents who believe their COVID-19 test was a part of the backlog and they're still waiting for their results. Well, they say all residents have been notified, but they want to inform you on exactly how the process works. That's for all of us, really. The notification comes as an automated message through either an email or a text message. Notifications are expected within three to four days. If you have not received your results by then, call 311 for help. The backlog affected people who got tested at the city run testing sites after July 2nd. A 14 year old girl now facing manslaughter charges for shooting and a resulting of the death of a 16 year old boy. The incident happened yesterday on Lake Pond around noon. Sheriff Salazar says some teenagers were playing with guns and taking pictures when the girl accidentally pulled the trigger. The victim identified as Moses Reyes was pronounced dead at the hospital. Sheriff Salazar says the girl told investigators she was the one who pulled the trigger. Deputies are looking for two other teenagers who were there when it all happened. Two new initiatives announced today in hopes of getting the community talking about reforms in the criminal justice system. The Bear County District Attorney's Office made that announcement during a virtual town hall tonight. They're working on two new programs, the DA Academy, which will allow the public to learn about the process of criminal cases. And it's not just for adults. Kids will also be able to participate in that. The second program is the Citizens Advisory Panel, which will include members of the community and experts. Those people will be able to meet with us to give us perspectives on things that we're doing in the office. They'll be able to tackle certain issues and they'll be able to talk to us about issues and concerns that they have regarding the criminal justice system. 
District Attorney Joe Gonzalez has also been working on other restorative justice programs, including site and release and personal recognizance bonds. He says his office will continue looking at ways to make more improvements. The unemployment rate in Bear County dropped to 8.8% in June. Workforce Solutions Alamo released last month's job report today. The rate for Bear County in May was 13.2%. McMullen County had the lowest unemployment rate in Texas at 2.7% and Atascosa County had the highest at 9.9%. The report shows the Texas unemployment rate fell from 8.9% in June compared to 12.7% in May. Still ahead in the night beat another record high number of COVID-19 cases in a single day. This is more families are dealing with heartbreaking losses. The latest numbers from around the nation. Having a baby can be scary for new mothers, especially during a pandemic. We're going to speak with an expecting mother who's considering changing her plans to an at home birth. Hear her story coming up. Plus, the three men charged in a connection with shooting and killing an unarmed black man while he was jogging. They appeared in court today. How they pleaded in the case. Pregnancy during COVID-19, it's a different world now as soon to be moms prepare for, for the birth of their children. Many are now choosing to give birth at home. The night team Stephen Cavazos with one pregnant woman's story and the extra precautions midwives must now take. A happy announcement for the Green family. They were expecting baby number four, but... Actually found out that we had corona and we had a baby coming in the same day. Two unexpected surprises. Sarah Green says she and her husband both tested positive for the virus back on June 23rd after experiencing symptoms for almost a week. The family went into self-isolation. Green says the first few days were the hardest. Am I having... Is my body tender for pregnancy or am I having body aches from, <laughs> from COVID? The couple's three young children were not tested, but Green believes they had the virus. The whole family has since recovered and are already preparing for the newest addition. Green says she wanted an at-home birth. So it was a hands-down no-brainer that we're going to do another home birth. Nikki McIver Brown helped Green deliver her youngest daughter two years ago, but she says things have drastically changed since then. We just don't know what can happen. It may be nothing. McIver Brown says not enough is known about expecting mothers and COVID-19. While many of her patients prefer an intimate setting when they give birth, plans could change if they experience complications from the virus. If they were having any shortness of breath, any respiratory distress, anything going on with baby, then that would warrant a transfer to the hospital. University Health System says more pregnant women have been testing positive for COVID-19 between the ages of 18 to 40. They say their hospitals are a safe place to deliver, but women shouldn't change their birthing plans because of COVID-19 fears. McIver Brown says regardless of the birthing place. Things now um, have changed, but babies still come out the same exact way. Green says she's looking forward to her birth at home and hopes her experience with COVID-19 can help other expecting mothers. If you can encourage someone and give someone else hope, um, I think that's more important. Stephen Cavasso's case at 12 News. With the younger people making up a large chunk of the county's COVID cases, the city and community coalition trying to bring younger voices to help encourage the younger crowd to be safe. One of its work groups for the COVID-19 Community Response Coalition came up with the idea of asking younger people with larger online followings for help. Influencers. They're asking these peer influencers, if you will, to help create content related to the idea of three P's. Preventing transmission, protecting themselves and family, and providing information to contract tracers if necessary. The group figures the message would be better received this way than top down messages from public health officials. Because it's the message is coming from somebody within your own peer group. It's somebody that you know, you respect, that looks like you, that talks like you, that 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 moves within your social circle. The city also hired a marketing agency to help with a campaign based around the same three P's idea. It's expected to be rolled out in the next few weeks. Now to the latest in the killing of Georgia jogger Ahmad Arbery. The three men charged with ambushing him, killing him, appeared today in court making the judge, making a plea rather to the judge. They appeared via video conference today dressed in orange jumpsuits and masks, pleading not guilty. Last month, the grand jury indicted Gregory McMichael and his son Travis for allegedly ambushing, shooting and killing Arbery as he was jogging in February. William Bryan, the man who recorded the entire incident on his cell phone, was also arrested and charged in the crime and has also pled not guilty. Arbery's mother spoke following today's hearing. 
I am asking this court to say no. He cannot go home. He did not allow my son to go home. If convicted, the suspects face life in prison without parole. The trial date has not been set. Live cam, I am told that there was a lot of people who enjoyed when this gust front came through tonight. Oh, cooled yeah. things down quite oh, nicely, yeah. I'm told, because it <laughs> happened like right about 615. We and, were here. You know, we were doing stuff. Yeah, I did. So get they a, say. I did get a, get a quick text from Katie Blake, who got it first at her place, and then followed by Justin Horn, who was a little farther west. <laughs> so we, we were all in touch with each other when it moved through, and I was inside, not you know enjoying it out there. But it was a nice outflow boundary that moved through from the distant thunderstorms earlier today. And speaking of those distant storms, take a look at some of the rain that fell along the coastal plain. We had some good downpours, Victoria, Goliad area, and especially down into. B County and closer to the coastline, Refugio area actually uh, did measure over two inches of rainfall from one of those really heavy clusters of thunderstorms. That was earlier today. Now we don't have anything on the radar screen. You see the last little remnants of those showers over the past few hours dissipate as they move closer to Laredo. Nothing out there right now, but you go back about 10 hours today and you saw the shower started in the Houston area. They basically just worked their way along the coastline. They had a hard time making it inland. A few popped up in Wilson County, and we had one near Calaveras Lake and then one down near Somerset briefly isolated little pop ups, but that was it. It did impact temperatures, though, farther to the south and east of San Antonio. They were noticeably cooler than the rest of us because of the rain cooled air and the clouds. So this is all part of a little disturbance that's swirling in the air. It's not a strong disturbance. It's a little dip in the upper level flow, but it's actually an upside down dip. They happen a lot this time of year. They come off the Gulf of Mexico, and that's what we're getting now. It's going to linger a bit through tomorrow, so we can't rule out a few more showers. I just don't anticipate the nice signatures on the radar that we saw today. It was really good coverage along the coastline. I'd give it about a 10% shot across our viewing area as we get into tomorrow. Obviously, we could use the rain. We all know that it'd be nice to have it. Panhandle needs it the most, looking at the newest drought monitor. 32%, so almost one third of Texas, is considered in drought right now, and that includes parts of South Texas here. We're abnormally dry here in San Antonio. That's the yellow color, but in drought as you get westward, Uvalde, Carrizo Springs area, La Prior, all the way to Del Rio Eagle Pass, Kamado, all the way to the uh, Rio Grande there. So we could use the rain, but I do want to talk about African dust as we are expecting more in the sky. Now, this is just an image of the forecast as we get into Monday, but let me replay this for you and show you what's going to happen here as we go through time. Now, notice today a decent amount of dust in place, but as we get on into the upcoming weekend, we'll see a, surge, a resurgence of it tomorrow for Saturday. As for Sunday, it gets pushed westward. That's the nice thing. That dust and that extra haze in the air will get pushed off to the west as we get into Sunday. And uh, by Monday, Tuesday, there you go. You're not even going to notice that dust in the air. It was a hazy sunset this evening. It sure was. We had that extra dust in the air. We made it to 101 for the high today. That's four degrees below the record, but six degrees above the average high temperature right now 81 at the airport in town 79 Stinson 78 Pleasanton. We're still feeling the effects of that outflow boundary, at least locally. You get at the junction 90 degrees Del Rio currently at 96 and of course high humidity and we'll feel that humidity uh, for quite some time. So tomorrow morning widespread 70s mid to upper then tomorrow afternoon. I think most of us in the mid to upper 90s with the exception of being right near triple digits closer to the border. So 75 in San Antonio tomorrow morning, 96 by the afternoon. A mixture of sun and clouds all weekend long, mostly mid to upper 90s for highs. 10% chance of a shower tomorrow. And then basically those sea breeze showers, those daily coastal showers all the way through the seven day forecast. But you'll notice no excessive heat this time around. Yeah, the heat we've had, I feel like has made us appreciate the little things like yeah, a like tiny little breeze. We're jumping for joy. Yeah, like 96 degrees. That's what it's all Something about. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. All right, so 
we're getting a little more clarity on what's going to happen with high school football. Well, after the order by San Antonio Metro Health today, in effect, what it does is on the larger districts, it kind of wipes out the non-district games. In other words, the first two weeks of the regular season. When we come back here, how that order has actually been taken a step further by TAPS now, and our NFL training camp's good to go. <laughs> Coming up. As you heard at the top of our broadcast tonight, San Antonio Metro Health has ordered all public and private schools in Bear County to not allow on-campus instruction or activities until September the 7th. That means the first two weeks of the high school football season are out. The Texas Association of Private and Parochial Schools has delayed the start of their high school football season until September the 28th. That decision also made today due to the rising cases of coronaviruses in the state of Texas, while affects such schools in San Antonio area as Central Catholic, Antonian, and San Antonio Christian, to name a few. Workouts cannot begin before September the 8th and the first scrimmage can't be held until September 21st. As a coach, you're just looking for the opportunities to be with your kids and, and watch the development that comes through athletics. And while we're going to lose some practices in, in the beginning of the season, we are really, really excited to hear that we're still planning to have a season this fall. The University of Interscholastic League, which covers most all the public schools in the state of Texas, is expected to make their announcement on Monday. Our San Antonio Spurs tip off the restart of the 2019-2020 NBA season two weeks from tonight. In the meantime, continue their workouts inside the bubble the NBA has provided to the wide world of sports complex at Disney World. DeJounte Murray telling us today he's not afraid of the rush to return to the court after having four months off, even though it is his first season back since he blew out his knee in 2018. And with their first scrimmage with another team not until next Thursday, DeJounte says just being back on the court with his teammates is good enough right now. I think we're more looking forward to scrimmaging today and days before we get to, you know, actual scrimmage versus another team. I mean, because we're going at it. Uh, you got black, you got silver, they mix it around here and there. But, I mean, we've just been happy to be on the floor. And, you know, we really, we'll really we play, what, two, two, three games, and we'll be mad that we can't play more. So I think we're just enjoying the moment, and uh, when the time comes, we'll be ready. Najante's backcourt teammate Derek White had told us earlier that during the NBA hiatus, the only way he could practice his defense was guarding his dog. <laughs> Derek was asked today how as getting back to five on five workouts helped him. You can't really duplicate playing five on five. Um, I mean, practice is pick up whatever it is. Um, those little quarantine workouts we're doing at the house. So um, it's always great. We, we love to play basketball, and um, that's what we've been doing since we were young. So uh, we feel comfortable, and um, it's always fun to get back on that court. All right, Spurs have tomorrow off. Derek says he's looking forward to their ping pong tournament. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. Washington team owner Daniel Snyder has issued a statement today, but it has nothing to do with being forced to change the Redskins' name or logo. It has everything to do with women who have come forward with sexual harassment and toxic workplace allegations against team staff members. As many as 15 women have come forward, according to the Washington Post, saying the incident took place between 2006 and 2019, and already two staff members have been fired. One has retired. Since the allegations came to light, Snyder has hired District of Columbia law firm Wilkerson Walsh to conduct an independent review of the team policies and allegations of the workplace misconduct. And the NFL issued a statement saying it will meet with the lawyers following the investigation and act accordingly. Here's what Snyder had to say in part in a statement he released today. The behavior described in yesterday's Washington Post article has no place in our franchise or society. The story has strengthened my commitment to setting a new culture and standard for our team, a process that began with the hiring of Coach Rivera earlier this year. Beth Wilkinson and her firm are empowered to do a full unbiased investigation, make any and all requisite recommendations recommendations upon completion of our work will institute new policies and procedures. The Houston Texans and the Kansas City Chiefs have told their rookies to report to training camp on July 20th, which is Monday. That's according to NFL.com that despite the fact the NFL and the Players Association has yet to come to an agreement on COVID-19 testing procedures, the rest of the league, including the Dallas Cowboys, are set to open their training camps on July 28th. Tony Romo gives us a moment to remember to send you into the weekend. <laughs> Next. And we leave you with this cherished moment as former Cowboys quarterback Tony Romo in the process of teaching his sons, Hawk and Rivers, how to play football. You ready? What? Yeah. Okay. What are you? Wait. What are you, Rivers? The wide receiver. Yeah, the wide receiver. Okay. You ready, Hawk? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I forgot what to say. Wide 80. Wide 80. Wide 80 said hi. Run your route. <laughs>
Tell run. him. Run that way. Run that way. No, I can't. I have the ball. Well, you got to run without the ball so he throws it to you. Uh, okay, now hold on. Stop. Come back a little bit. That's too far. There. Right there. Okay, Hawk. Yeah. There you go. Oh, well, good job. Did you catch it? No. Oh, it it's okay. Did he hit your belly? Come here. Come here. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is awesome. We hope you enjoy your weekend now. But I don't I, have the ball. That is, you awesome. know what? That's played out in a lot of backyards over the years. Just many. Yeah. <laughs> just remember the nerf. Nerf helps. The nerf helps. <laughs> it does. Yeah. We'll be right back. I want to take you to some breaking news right now at the Bulverde Oaks apartment on the north side. This is off Canyon Parkway. Details are limited, but here's what we do know. San Antonio police officials say they are dealing with a possible officer involved shooting, and you can see there are a number of police cruisers on the scene. Yeah, wrapped around all of those roads right there. San Antonio fire officials are reporting that one person is being transported to the hospital. Of course, this is a really big scene. It's just been an hour since the call came in, so we will continue to follow this developing story. We are talking jobs, those that have been lost and those who have people looking to hire. Romanita Mata Barrera is the executive director of SA Works, the workforce team within San Antonio's Economic Development Foundation. Uh, she is our guest on KSAT Q&A. Romanita, thank you for joining us. Right off the top, we know that there was a huge economic impact to San Antonio. How bad was it and what were the industry's hardest hit? First of all, thank you so much for, for hosting me and for all of these informative segments that you all have been hosting throughout uh, this process. So. As we know, we pride ourselves in having a very robust hospitality industry in San Antonio. And as can be expected, it was that industry in particular that was hardest hit at the start of the pandemic. It had the greatest and most lingering impact, particularly in our accommodations industry, our food and beverage industry, and our, and our retail sector as well. Now, we do have some positive news. We just got unemployment numbers that just came through today from uh, Workforce Solutions Alamo, and uh, we went from a 13.2 unemployment rate in uh, May to 8.8 percent. So we are seeing a slow but positive recovery. That's great. And, and, and I should say that we're getting a lot of this information from a jobs report. Uh, that you guys have just published and, and actually I think we can uh, we will have it on our website tonight as a matter of fact if people want to look through it. Yeah tell us about that report Romanita if you will and I know that you put these out twice a year but this one's a little different it's a specific edition for COVID-19 is that right? Absolutely Courtney so for the past two years we have been publishing this jobs report really it's a snapshot of the target demand industries in San Antonio that have the most promising economic mobility opportunities and uh, that are hiring locally. We wanna make this jobs report an easy to use resource for, for anyone in San Antonio. But as we were preparing to publish uh, this uh, quarterly uh, report, uh, we wanted to make sure that we would pivot some of our information. And so a couple of the key features that we added were uh, two uh, new industries, the financial services, as well as the skilled trade and construction industry, because we did see some resiliency in those industries, as well as in transferable skills. So we wanted to ensure that San Antonians who would pick up this report could look at what are some of the skills that they have, that they could potentially pivot into a new career in a new sector or in a new occupation. And so we wanted to add those two very specific features that would be relevant to what San Antonio's may be experiencing today. So we're looking at the, we just had a graphic up and I think we can bring it back up with the in-demand occupations that you sent us. What if I want to do one of these things, but I can't figure out how I get training? What are the resources out there for people that they need to know about? So this is a great question, Steve. As you know, as, as a community, we have come together, not only the Economic Development Foundation, but uh, the public sector, the city and the county, along with just a group of workforce agencies, I would say primarily Workforce Solutions Alamo as our lead workforce board here across the Bear County and extended region to look at that. How can we be more responsive to individuals? And so the jobs report really serves as a snapshot of 
what employers are hiring for and what are the skill sets. And that can help inform then these agencies that can help individuals transition into those jobs by assessing what are their interests and what are their skill sets and whether they may need short-term training or a little long-term training. And that's where that ecosystem of workforce agencies will be really critical as we all step up together to help San Antonians. And it's really nerve wracking, obviously, to be going through this losing your job. And a lot of people, like you were saying, Steve, they only do what they've only been doing what they're doing. So they don't really know that how transferable their skills are. But I've worked with you guys in your programs, and that's actually kind of a light at the end of the tunnel that you're going to be able to tell people that those skills do transfer to other industries. Absolutely, Courtney. We, we want to make sure that folks feel that they have hope that uh, all of the great work that maybe they've been doing in the retail sector or the hospitality sector, really developing those strong communication skills, customer service skills are critical, and sales skills, you can transfer those into the financial sector. You can transfer those into um, uh, now get into like IT sales, right? Really leveraging that. So we want to give individuals hope that how you can really leverage some of the skills that you've been developing over the last five, 10 years in a particular job, what, what is that roadmap going forward? And we wanna make sure that San Antonians definitely see that, that hope and the access to resources. How, how, where should people reach out? Where's a great resource to start if you have questions, if you're just thinking about doing something different than what you've been doing? Absolutely. I would say uh, for job seekers, Workforce Solutions Alamo is your first road, uh, your one-stop shop. They are then now partnering with multiple uh, workforce agencies across the city of San Antonio who can serve as a training provider. It could be UTSA or Alamo Colleges, but that is your first step as a job seeker is Workforce Solutions Alamo. We are the lead partner to our employer. So we I also want to make a call to action. If we have employers out there who are hiring or uh, have very specific workforce needs, please come to us because we are we are in that process of really intaking that information so that we know who's hiring in San Antonio and we can help share that information with our workforce partners. Yeah, these are important numbers that you guys are putting out in this jobs report, that's for sure. You know, you did talk about hope. We're just going to wrap this up and let you get your last word. And what do you want people to know about the situation they're going through and what the possible future could look like. Certainly, uh, you're not alone. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as a community, we uh, pride ourselves in collaboration. And now more than ever, all of us have our respective core competencies and we are coming together, sharing information that are really intended to help job seekers get back to work uh, or find their what's next and making that transition as easy as possible. And uh, just based on the diversity of our economy, we feel that San Antonio is poised uh, to recover. Great. Poised for what's next. Yep. I like Love that. It. Romanita Mata Barrera, thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll be right back. The country passing another grim milestone, more than 77,000 positive coronavirus cases in a single day. A new record, and that now includes 5,000 cases that weren't previously counted. The White House now with an unpublished report saying many states should roll back reopening, including Florida. That's where ABC's Zareen Shaw starts us off with one family's heartbreaking loss. As the coronavirus continues taking lives, this scene serving as a reminder of the challenges patients face battling the virus alone. You don't recognize me with all this junk on my face, but it is Sam. I love you, sweetheart. I love you so much. After months of not seeing his wife of nearly 30 years as she battled the coronavirus, 90-year-old Sam Reck risking his life to visit Joanne, wanting to say goodbye one last time. Finally getting to hold, hold your hand after all these months. You finally let me hold your hand. Feel me squeezing your hand. Joanne passing away in a Florida hospital, one of the 26 states with a climbing daily death toll. It also happens to be one of 18 states in a new and unpublished White House task force document the Center for Public Integrity obtained considered red zones where reopenings are recommended to be rolled back. A White House official saying the list was a guide for response efforts, not for the public to see. 
One of the states on that list is Georgia. We shouldn't need a mass mandate for people to do the right thing. The state's governor, Brian Kemp, suing the city of Atlanta and its mayor for enforcing what he says is the right thing to do. Mayor Bottoms' mass mandate cannot be enforced, but her decision to shutter businesses and undermine economic growth is devastating. I refuse to sit back and watch as disastrous policies threaten the lives and livelihoods of our citizens. The governor has simply overstepped his bounds and his authority, um, and we'll see him in court. Georgia is also one of the states where testing can take up to hours. Back in Florida, some locations closing after running out of tests. That's where 16-year-old Haley O'Connell was sent home from the ER because her symptoms weren't considered severe enough. After being unable to breathe, she went back to the hospital, testing positive for the virus and spending over a week on a ventilator before finally leaving. This is your friend. This is your sister. This can happen to you. California's governor also fearing for people in this state. He said today that all schools, public and private, would stay closed this fall in 32 counties unless there were two straight weeks of cases dropping. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. And President Trump facing increased pressure and scrutiny over his administration's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. A new ABC News Washington Post poll finds six in 10 Americans disapprove of his handling of the pandemic and just 34% trust what the president says about the crisis. The United States has become the worst affected country in the world with more than three and a half million confirmed cases. President Trump, meanwhile, says something big is in the works, but he's not elaborating. We have many exciting things that we'll be announcing over the next uh, eight weeks, I would say. Things that nobody has even contemplated, thought about, thought possible. Meanwhile, congressional leaders are at odds over another potential coronavirus relief package. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he expects to unveil outlines of another bill next week with a price tag around $1 trillion. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says that's not enough. Well, two more big box retailers will require all, all customers wear face masks inside their stores. A mandate at all Lowe's stores starts on Monday and Home Depot will follow on Wednesday. Most Home Depot and Lowe's stores were open during stay at home orders earlier this year. They were considered essential businesses in most states. Both companies were already requiring employees to wear masks. Other major chains like Walmart, Target, CVS and Best Buy are all now requiring their customers wear masks. Pilots with United Airlines could end up keeping their jobs thanks to an agreement between the company and their union. Earlier this month, the airline warned more than 2,200 pilots that they were at risk of being furloughed. That's because the federal bailout money available under the CARES Act is set to run out at the end of September. The deal includes early retirement packages for pilots nearing the mandatory retirement age of 60, along with a variety of voluntary furlough offers that will maintain benefits like health insurance and some other arrangements that would cut hours. Take a look outside with live cam. You know, once it gets to a certain degree, you just feel like it all feels the same. I feel like we're, <laughs> I feel like we're out of that realm right now. If you can tell the difference between tonight and a couple nights ago. Okay. Don't you think? No, Steve I'm, doesn't I'm agree. I don't think he does. I don't, th I don't think his face agrees with me. I, I, I think I'm just taking in the wisdom from Courtney. You don't usually get it, so. <laughs> well, no, I do. I, th I agree with you. I think you get, we are in the realm now. I mean, 81 degrees is as low a temperature as it's been at this hour in a all long week. time. Did actually. I teach More you More than a something? week, probably. Yes, oh that's what God. I'm saying. Are you it's seeing a moment this? For this is being documented online. Bottle this. <laughs> Bottle this moment, okay? <laughs> He wasn't just pulling a pun to make fun win. of us, okay? No, he was being serious. <laughs> well, talk about no, the... no, no. I wasn't making fun of her. <laughs> right. I want to be naturally, clear. Naturally. Naturally. Yeah. All right. I think that goes without I'm, saying. Yeah. I'm okay. taking it right. out. I'm I just, sorry. I tried to squeeze the yes You, in there and see what I mean, happened. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> All right. Let's take a look at the heat across the state today. Not as bad as days past. Not a big record breaking day, contrary to what we had at the start of the work week, but. Plenty of triple digits on the map, that's for sure. Amarillo, 102, along with Midland, El Paso, 103. Laredo, one of the hot spots at 105, and Del Rio, just one degree behind them at 104. That was earlier today. Even Gonzalez topped out at 102. So we hit the century mark again here in San Antonio, and we have actually for a week straight now, I believe, starting last Friday. We're at, we've been at 100 degrees, so 81 degrees right now. Dew point is 68, so that makes it feel like it's 84. So tack on a few degrees in terms of the heat index or feels like temperature.
Look at the 70s we already have closer to the coastline. Beeville 74, Victoria 78, 78 in Pleasanton. The rain cooled air and the extra clouds from those showers along the coastline today really helped mitigate the heating southeast of town. Here in San Antonio, oh, we just updated 79 now, but you get farther to the west where they didn't get the outflow boundary in Del Rio, still in the mid 90s. And we're all feeling the humidity, of course. And that's just something we have to get used to, especially in July in San Antonio. Here's a look at the radar over the past 10 hours or so, and you'll see that we have those showers that developed and some thunderstorms along the coastline. Nothing severe, but some good soaking rain within some of those. Refurio reported two and a half inches of rain. Now that was the exception, not the norm, but at least somebody was getting some much needed moisture. And this is all a result result of a little upper level swirl that's in the air. It's going on the south side of the upper level high. It's a sp split blue H right now. And because it's displaced a little farther to the north, this is able to kind of meander its way into South Texas and help give our atmosphere a little bit of kick, at least along the coastline. Tomorrow we give it a 10% chance of a few showers popping up. So slim, not none. But slim. Here's the dust. It was noticeable in the air today. The Saharan air layer, as it's technically called, African dust, it's in place. And tomorrow you'll notice it as well. If you didn't have a problem with it today, you won't have a problem with it tomorrow. But as we get into Sunday and especially Monday, it really gets pushed out of here and disperses. So you won't notice that extra bit of dust in the sky by late Sunday and through basically early next week. So 75 in the morning, 96 by the afternoon, basically the same as we go into Sunday, mixture of sun and clouds. There's that 10% chance, nothing impressive in terms of rainfall totals, unfortunately, anytime soon, except for along the coastline. The closer to the coast you are, the better your odds are of some of those daily pop-up sea breeze showers. Even then, pretty isolated in nature, but here's the difference. You look at this seven day, you don't see one triple digit reading on there. We'll be back coming right up. We've some sad late breaking news to report. The Associated Press now reporting the death of U.S. Representative John Lewis. Lewis was receiving hospice care at the time of his death. He was diagnosed with cancer last year. He played a key role in the civil rights movement and marched in Selma, Alabama with Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. back in 1965. He was also a part of the Bloody Sunday March. Lewis was 80 years old. Well, it has been a busy week, including the primary runoff elections, with one race coming down to just seven votes. And nearly 6,000 new cases of COVID-19 reported in Bexar County after a miscommunication over a filing system with the state-run testing sites. Here's the Nightbeat in Review. Yeah, former Constable Michelle Barrantes Vela held that position before she was forced to resign after announcing her run for sheriff. She's been the subject of a nine month criminal investigation and denies allegations of wrongdoing. To complete her term, the commissioner's court appointed Leticia Vasquez, constable for precinct two. Vasquez, who said when she was appointed she would not seek reelection, is now in a runoff against Eno Badillo, a 35 year veteran with the Bexar County Sheriff's Office. And you can see right now, it looks like Leticia Vasquez has 59% of the vote to 41% for Eno Badillo. After being at the office and meeting those people in person, and getting to know everybody and the community that was reaching out to me, I realized that, you know what, I have to do this for the for the betterment of the office of the community. You know, we had a strategy, we had a, a fundraising plan. You know, it's hard when uh, you, you, you don't use the, uh, you can't use the incumbency of, of, the, of the office to campaign, and especially with the pandemic hit. Air Force veteran and writer MJ Hagar and State Senator Royce West, who represents District 23 in North Texas, including Dallas, both making it to the runoff. And you can see right now, it looks as though she will face incumbent Senator John Cornyn. Cornyn first elected in 2002, taking over for longtime Senator Phil Graham. Mayor Nuremberg announcing a task force created to discuss how schools will operate amid this pandemic. The task force is made up of teachers, parents, students, teachers unions, school districts, pediatricians, and public health officials. Metro Health Assistant Director Mario Martinez says San Antonio and Bexar County have two refrigerator trailers that can hold up to 24 to 36 bodies each. And we can't emphasize enough the the precaution measures that we've stated before and will repeat again that wearing the face covering 
it does work. And the fact that we have some folks at the state and federal level who are questioning whether or not we should count that test makes it seem like some folks want, or some people at the state and federal level are trying to suppress uh, just how bad this COVID pandemic is. The mayor showing his frustration during tonight's briefing. The state removed more than 3,400 cases from its COVID-19 dashboard yesterday, stating that Metro Health was submitting probable and confirmed cases. But the state doesn't accept probable cases. A college student in Boston getting the gift of a lifetime. John Capron was shopping when he saw a Whitney piano. The 23 year old asked permission to play and the store shot video of his don't stop believe in performance, which went viral. That's it. The store owner not only offered to give him a piano, he upgraded from the $200 Whitney to a $3,000 Steinway and Sons piano that he gave to him. That is an incredible story. We'll get back to this breaking news though right now. An officer involved shooting at an apartment complex on the north side. This is a live picture outside of the Bulverde Oaks apartments. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus says it started with the family violence call that a woman made. When the first officer arrived on scene, she told him their, her boyfriend had a knife and gun. McManus says that the man opened fire and that happened in the breezeway. You can find the rest of this information on KSAT.com. Have a great weekend.